Hey guys, good evening. It is the 31st of May, and I guess that means it's time for our end of May backer request live stream. And I didn't get any notifications from you guys that you had any specific requests. So I'm going to do the following. We're going to start with some animal sketching as a warm up. Then I'm going to move into how to how I draw chibis. And then we're going to go into chibi inks. Um, and at any time, especially when I'm switching activities, if you'd like to see something else, please let me know. Unfortunately, I can't do specific watercolor or marker techniques because those take time to those take a couple days to prepare and I just <laughs> I need advance notice for that kind of stuff so we're gonna go ahead and get started and I pulled up you guys can't see it in fact you can't even see me because uh, we can't do dual cameras using my camcorder um, but I have some animal reference pulled up I just looked up wildlife photos on Google if you guys can think of a specific um, resource that i should be checking out i would appreciate it if you told me um that would be super helpful and i've also got my chat in the sidebar i'm trying to find a good place for it that doesn't take over my ability to see the animals that i'm going to be drawing as a warm-up and since we did like yoga poses figure drawing last time i thought this would be a good change of pace When I am not horrifically busy, I enjoy doing warm-ups. Unfortunately, this month has been really, really hectic. So I've not been as good about it as normal. So for me, animals are very similar to people in that they are a selection or a variety of shapes kind of cobbled together to form a whole. And uh, for me, I don't draw animals as often as some people do. I have friends who are anthro art artists and they draw animals way more often than I do. Um, so they're a lot better at it and they aren't reliant on reference. But I am still reliant on reference, especially for um, wild animals like this lion I'm drawing. And we're sort of testing out something new today. Um, last month, we recorded and had it streamed straight to YouTube, and that had a lot of problems. So this month, we are streaming to you, Ustream, as you guys can tell, because my camera will do direct to Ustream, and it will also record. So hopefully, some of the quality issues that plagued my first video are not going to be an issue here. And um, if any of you guys are interested in streaming yourselves or um, doing combination YouTube uh, streaming sort of content, I have no problem sharing what I've learned with you guys. And hopefully you can start off on the right foot. Of course, there's also plenty of good resources for this sort of stuff. And since we get kind of um, minimal, I'll say, minimal attendance on these streams, next month I may open this up a little bit more so that there's more engagement. Although if this U stream works out, um, we will probably always have it on this service and I'll try to send out the inv invites with the Sunday newsletter. And as you can see, I use both the point of the pencil and the side of the pencil when I'm working on these sort of studies.
Anytime you guys see me reaching away, I'm either checking the stream chat or I am looking up fresh reference. I wonder if there's any way I can work a face cam into this setup. I kind of miss it. And you can tell I haven't drawn animals in a while because I'm a little bit rough. But that's why if I were regularly doing reg warm ups of these, that's why that would be so beneficial because it's muscle memory. So you're training your hand to know what shapes to go for. And if any of you are considering becoming convention artists or selling your stuff at conventions, this muscle memory is really, really beneficial because there are so many so many days where I am exhausted at the table. You know, I haven't gotten to eat all day. I haven't gotten to go to the bathroom. It's four o'clock on a Saturday. I've been drawing nonstop. I just don't have the brain power, but my hand knows what to do and I can let it take over and uh, handle the drawing for me. And I can tell I'm out of practice because I'm having to do more thinking than I normally have to do about how I want to approach these shapes. And part of the issue is I'm just flat out worn out. I have been, I have spent the past. Oh, hey, hey, Blake, hey. Since the, <laughs> Man, this, this hawk looks a lot more like a parrot than it does a hawk. You can tell I really need to practice with birds. Maybe when things kind of chill out a little bit, I'll do like a monk study where um, I just draw birds every day. Yeah, I definitely need to work more on birds. This bird is really rough looking. In fact, I think that will be what I Google. Birds. I need to get proficient enough at this.
I don't know if the camera can pick because sometimes the camera is surprisingly good at picking up my cat making noises and uh, my demo table from conventions is down and he jumped on it. And the noise sort of surprised me because it was pretty loud. Oh my goodness, I just found the fattest, cutest little bird. So given the fact that there's a bit of lag between what is shown on camera and um, what's actually happen happening in real life, I bet a, a minute lag, really. Um, I am typing into chat in the chat rather than vocalizing it because there's such a delay. That would be really confusing for me. So um, hopefully it's less confusing for those of you, for you guys who's watching. Also, that'll make it a little bit easier when I release this to YouTube. Um, that way, you know, our private conversations or our conversations aren't aren't um, sort of getting broadcast to the whole world even more so. So last month for May, I tried streaming from my Surface Pro, which is why we had a face cam going. Um, and I was using the um, inexpensive little document viewer that I've had for a while. And I used to use for streams fairly often. I was using that to capture what was going on on the desktop. And the video quality <laughs> was just atrocious. It was so, so bad. So um, today I'm streaming with my camcorder, which is what I use to do the normal YouTube videos. And um, so it does have a, a face capturing function. It can do that with my, my cell phone, but it can't broadcast and record video and capture footage from my cell phone. So that's why 
we don't have a face cam today, which is kind of a shame because I got a haircut and I was like, oh, I'm going to look all cute for the stream. And then, nope. 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 Oh, dang it. And those of you guys in my in my channel in the chat thing right now, if I like lose track of what I'm saying, can you please just remind me? Because I'm trying to do audio that works for YouTube as well as for you guys. That's why I'm also chatting with you guys in the chat. This is the first time in a long time I've tried to juggle both. So I'm still sort of figuring things out and I have my audio turned off so we're not going to get like that endless horrible feedback loop that sometimes happens Blake, did you send the link? It's not showing up in my tweets, but I don't know if it just hasn't refreshed. Send me that link and I will do the first chibi as one of your characters. I guess it would have been faster to type that. Okay, so we are moving on to how I draw chibi characters. And these are really popular at conventions. They're kind of a mainstay of what I sell. Um, you don't really need that many things. We're going to start out with a non-photo blue mechanical pencil. It's got color eno non photo blue lead in it which you can get on amazon and then just like a variety of erasers in case i mess up and for conventions i usually draw them pretty large cuz i need room to do detail and it's harder for me well an amount of detail and it's hard for me to do detail if um i don't have enough room i'm going to pull in so you guys can see and make some room over here and i'm gonna start off with um i'm gonna be i'm gonna be a brat and draw myself because i'm waiting on a link for something and i wanted some channel art anyway so we're gonna start with just a headshot so i pretty much draw a cute fat little oval and then underneath it, I sort of draw what's going to end up becoming the cheeks. And even with simplified or uh, cutesy characters, see if I can get in so that you guys can see that. Even with simplified or cutesy characters, I still draw the three eyes and make sure they're at least one eye width apart. And for con commissions, I usually draw them smiling. And I apologize because my camera is shaking because it's attached to the desk. And I guess I'm shaking the desk. I also do really big 
sort of jug style ears. I think those are particularly cute. And I also designate where the eyebrows are gonna land. That's why they're sort of like the raccoon circle around the eyes. And if I were doing shading, that would also help me figure out where to put the shading over the over the eyes. Now with chibis, I prefer a larger forehead to a smaller forehead because what you're really going for are childlike or baby or baby proportions. So um, I will put the hairline a little bit higher than I would and I sometimes even make the head itself bigger. To sort of accommodate those proportions. And a lot of the chibis I end up drawing are, you know, actual people from conventions. So I will vary what I draw to suit their portrait. And since I'm drawing myself, And really, it's all about um, finding what you think looks cute and then sort of expounding on it or expanding. <laughs> I guess I want to say expanding. So, like, for example, I think... I often think that hair that ends in like the curve instead of sh uh, sharper lines looks cuter. So that's, that's sometimes what I'll go with. Usually I do the eyes a little bit bigger. I don't know why I did them so small today. Do this in a minute when we're inking. So, um, one of my fantastic backers is hanging out in the stream, who I was chatting to a little bit earlier, and I'm going to draw one of his characters since he's in the stream, and because that's what this is for, right? And since he was interested in seeing how I do chibis, I thought it would be um, fun to draw one of his characters. And um, I will link his comic. His comic is The Ocean's Call, and it's theoceanscall.smackjeeves.com, and I'm going to signal boost it on my Twitter um, but I can also link it in the <laughs> in the description below when this goes on to YouTube. And um, it's about Adam and Drank, the two main characters. And I am going to be exploring this comic along with you guys. So I am going to start off with the blonde hair character. Who I need I need to know your name. Ah, Adam. All right, we're starting with Adam. Actually, I have some stuff to send Blake this month. Anyway, so I'm going to go grab a piece of cardstock and I'll be right back.
All right, cardstock. So we, we're starting with a male character. And usually when I start with male characters, I like to start with a rectangle first. And with most adult male care, oh shoot, you guys can't see any of that. Let's see if I can, if there is anything I can do about that. Shows up a little bit better when there's not direct light on it. I'll just have to carve it in stone. It's the problem with non-photo blue, <laughs> non-photo blue. But when I'm starting with adults, um, they have different torsos than kids. Let me grab a piece of scratch paper, come on. How annoying. I like sort of straighten things up. And now I don't have my scratch paper anymore. All right, so um, this is just plain cheap printer paper. When I'm starting with kids, male or female, I start with like the little, the little cylinder, uh, the little rectangle. When I'm doing adult males, I do a triangle or a rectangle that's broader at the top. When I do women, um, I do usually do some variation on the hourglass figure depending on how the character is built. So since we're starting with Adam, we're gonna start with the, the broad-shouldered triangle. And then I usually, or almost always, do an egg. Or really, it's like a, a scooped egg, but when you're just starting out with this, you can do a full egg, and that's gonna become the rib cage. And then I draw the neck hole at the top, and that's more for me than what anyone else is gonna see. Now this is like the line of action for the shoulders basically the collarbone, but not really. And I start sort of roughing in the, gest the gesture of the figure. Using triangles to indicate feet and really just sticks to indicate the basic gesture. Because you don't really want to start figuring things out too early on. And now we're back to that circle. With the crosshair line of action for the face. And Adam has a little bit of a longer face. with kind of a sharp chin. Now at this stage, I can either start blocking in the face or I can start blocking in the rest of the figure. And you know, when I'm at cons, if I'm brain dead, what I'll start with is I'll start by blocking in the figure because I, I it's okay if I like have to sort of find what I'm doing with the with the pose. It's not okay if I don't know what I'm doing with the face. So while I'm figuring out the face, I'll often rough in everything that doesn't really... See, I've, I do so many of these that it's basically muscle memory, which is what I was talking to you guys about earlier with the um, animal reference drawings. You know, I'm trying to build up muscle memory. I'm trying to make myself familiar with enough with this that I could do it even if I was half asleep. So. And 
And I think that's important. Those are important skills, especially if you do like animation or comics, because you're going to be drawing so many very similar things over and over and over again that, um, you know, if your hand can do some of the thinking for you, it really helps you out. Our feet are basically, from the side, they're basically wedges, right? And this is where your leg would come in and then your heel would be back there. So when I'm thinking about feet, I start out with a triangle because the triangle would be the front facing shape. And if I'm drawing it from a three quarter view, So um, I basically extend the triangle a little bit past where the leg bone meets in with the heel bone. Um, and a lot of people, when they draw legs and feet, it's really like this, right? So like this would be the heel. This is the back of the leg. Nothing sticks out. But that to me, that doesn't make sense. And it doesn't if you look at how people's feet are, it doesn't make sense. You need that little bit extra behind there, otherwise you would tip over. So that's basically how I'm thinking about feet. Dang it. So now we've got, let me adjust the camera a little bit. Now we've got the full figure done. So it's time to start in with the face. And Adam has big blue eyes and kind of a long nose. And he looks like he's smiling pretty often. So after I've basically blocked in the eyes, I usually start by delineating the upper eyelid or the upper eyelash first. I think I drew his eyes a little bit too spacey, so I need to erase those irises and redraw them.
Yeah, some swooshy bangs. Oh, no, his hair is going off the paper. Honestly, I really like doing detailed chibi, chibi art, drawings, illustrations of people's more cartoony characters or OCs. That's like a lot of fun for me. So Adam is a lot of fun right now because um, they tend to just have like more stylized hair. And that's really fun to interpret in a different way. I love how different it looks like with anime characters. It's so easy to just kind of redraw. what's already in place and that's a little bit i mean that can get a little bit boring sometimes so <sighs> drawing people's ocs is a lot of fun for me or their comic characters or them drawing people all of those options is a lot of fun for me And hands tend to be something that throws a lot of people. And it used to throw me too. Um, basically, you should think of the hand as being in the same or roughly the same shape as a stop sign or the back pocket on a pair of pants. And there's going to be three zones of padding, one on each side of the bottom and then one at the top. And depending on which hand this is, and something, um, if you really, I, okay, so handedness is always a problem for me. So I have to reference my own and I have to stop and think about it. When your hands are facing away from you, your thumbs are always pointing inward. I wish I could show this better if I had the face cam, I would. Next time, next time I'll do it. Um, Basically, I just think about the hand in a constructive way, the same way I think about cartooning people. So um, I will use like skeletons and I will use rough shapes and rough gestures and then refine from there. And with chibi characters, hands are a little bit easier because you don't need to worry about joints. You don't need to worry about creases. All that just adds too much detail unless that's like a discerning, a defining character trait so you can just like do stick fingers and then sort of flesh them out but if you want to draw hands in action i will often reference my own but i also caricature it i mean like sketch it out a lot so this is gonna this lump here represents three fingers and that's going to be refined and this over here is the pointer finger i'm basically doing like this kind of a, a gesture and this is another thing that you know taking some time out in the evening when you're tired and you're kind of brain dead that's honestly the best time for me when i'm tired and i'm brain dead to do studies um because I can just do a bunch of them and I'm training myself so that when I'm tired, I can pull from that. I don't know why it just works like that. Um, but you know, doing a bunch of hand studies is also really helpful and, you know, referencing your own hands.
So I break that mass up into smaller shapes. And if you're drawing somebody holding something, what you should do is you should draw the object first. So let's say they're holding a baseball. And I'm not referencing this, so this might end up too large. Uh, they're holding a baseball, right? So first of all, I might, you know, hold an actual ball in my hand while I'm drawing it and look at my hand, see what it looks like, how the fingers wrap around it. But it helps to draw the object first and then draw the fingers around it or behind it. So the reason my lead keeps snapping is A, I'm bearing down way too hard on it, and B, I don't have enough padding between the metal of my, or really it's glass, the glass of my desk, and this piece of paper. Now I could put my sketchbook underneath this and that would leave any, ugh, alleviate a lot of the snapping. So if you're wasting a lot of ed, lead, a lot of ed, a lot of ed because I just corrected myself. If you're wasting a lot of lead because you bear down too hard, you're too heavy handed, what have you, um, put like a stack of paper between your hand and, dang it, your lead, lead of your pencil, or, um, you know what, I'm just gonna be quiet because I am like all over the place tonight. Okay, so Adam wears a hoodie and it looks like a v-neck underneath, a white v-neck. And hoodies from the front are really easy to draw. Those of you who are old enough to remember Sailor Fuku's, like Sailor Moon, um, the collar on a, on a Sailor Fuku, right? It goes in, it goes up like that. So it's two triangles attached, right? And then like the bow. Snapping pencils, right? Okay, well, a hoodie is basically from the front, basically functions the same way because the hood has folded over. I gestured to myself. <laughs> the hood is folded over onto the front. So it would be like that. This is the fold. And then, you know, the area behind. And then a lot of hoodies even have like that shoestringy looking stuff that comes from the front. And you can draw like a little zigzag to represent the zipper with the little metal zip coming from the front. So that's why I am drawing the hoodie the way I'm drawing it, because it's how hoodies look. And they also have arm sleeves. Most people end up getting a hoodie that's way too big for them, myself included, because I have monkey arms and I like my hoodie sleeves to come down past my arms. So. <sighs> yeah. 
And most hoodies also have this like stretchy fabric on the cuffs and on the bottom of the jacket. So I am drawing that as well. So now all that's really left is to draw the pants. And when I'm inking this guy, I will also explain some things that I'm kind of glossing over, like, you know, quick and easy folds, because I know they're kind of hard to see with this non-photo blue lead. Um, but it'll be a lot easier to see what I'm doing with the black ink. So Blake said he wears tennis shoes. I like to draw tennis shoes with like really fat laces. So that's what I tend to draw on my Chibi characters. And sometimes I'll draw the shoestrings poking out. Okay, so we have a basic, stay still, a basic chibi drawing. Um, depending on the grade of commission, if it's uh, pencils or inks, I might put graphite over this or I might ink it. And when I do ink it, I like to use these pens that are called Fude pens or sign pens. And I'm pretty sure you guys have heard me talk about these many times, but I love them so much. I feel like it always bears repeating. So I'm gonna ink this guy using this, but I'm gonna take a little bit of a break um, just to get some water, answer some in chat questions, so. All right, so just like with drawing, you should do warm ups with inking. And I'm gonna sacrifice this little self portrait because if I'm gonna screw up, I would rather screw up on something of mine that is me than on something I'm doing for somebody else. And I'm also grabbing a white Signo pin. These are pretty common. If your brick and mortars don't have them, you can get it off of Amazon. And one of the reasons I like Fude pins is they have a lot more give than, say, microns. So I can achieve multiple line widths without having to go over the same area too many times. I say that as I, like, get really persnickety about one particular area. Now, the spiral binding is definitely getting in the way, which is one of the reasons why I don't use, um, like, the Strath... Okay, so for conventions, I don't use the Strathmore Visual Arts Journals, even though they're very handy, um, just because it's easier to not work around the spirals. And yeah, I know some of the pages are perforated, but you know, sometimes when you're in a hurry and you're trying to rip that stuff out, it tears what you've already done. So I usually, when I'm doing commissions, I usually just go ahead and do it on, um, like decent quality cardstock.
So the Signo is great for correcting mistakes. And it's also great, um, let's say your hand is shot. My hand is pretty shot from today. I was doing a lot of other art stuff before tonight. So my line arts aren't quite what I'd like them to be. You need to let the ink, you need to let, you need to, yeah. Yeah, you need to allow the ink to dry before you put the Signo on top of it because this is water-based as well and it'll make it look really gray and weird and gross. Um, and it's going to be hard to correct that using uh, like levels or curves on the computer. But once it's dry, you can just go back over it and thin your lines out. I'll pull in so you guys can see what I'm doing. And I know some artists who they can take this to like overkill levels where they're spending all of their time correcting lines that just didn't work for them the first time. You know, oh, I was pulled in too much. Um, and that can be a problem too because you're spending so much time correcting what you do that you're not making more stuff. And you're not really learning a whole lot, honestly, when you're like using a correction tool like this or a whiteout to um, constantly refine your lines, you're really better off redrawing it if you're spending that much time correcting it. I mean, if the case is, you know, you're already really really proficient at what you're doing and you're just in a, a bad situation like you're at a convention or something and you're tired and you haven't eaten and that's why you're making mistakes and you're just trying to get through your commissions and that's why you're making a lot of corrections I understand that that's a different scenario I'm talking about if you're still learning how to ink you're still learning how to draw in a particular style Rather than spending that time making corrections, spend, just invest that time in drawing more of them. Unless, I mean, the other caveat is every now and then we draw something that is like that little taste of heaven. You know what I mean? That, that taste of things to come. That thing that's so much better than what you normally do. And I mean, it is quite possible that it might get screwed up when you're coloring it. Or it might get screwed up when you're inking it. So I could definitely understand why somebody want, might want to lavish a lot of time and attention in making corrections. I need to fix that camera. I was like way off screen. So when you're inking, especially if you're inking traditionally, there's a couple of other things you want to think about. You want to think about what your end use or end result is going to look like. And if you want to add color, while you can fill in areas with all black, like hair or eyes, um, you know, you might not want to because you're adding color and you might want to add color to those areas. So if you're adding color, you really kind of want to use a lighter hand when you're inking things in because you want to leave room for your color to add something to the piece. Especially with cutesy or simplified styles like this.
So for example, if I were doing this in black and white, and only black and white, I would fill in the hair with black and leave white highlights. And I would draw in freckles and I would fill in the eyes because I have darker eyes. Um, but since I want to possibly do color with this later on, if I do decide to keep it, um, I need or I'm going to leave those areas unfilled so I can fill them in with color later. I mean, you can, um, and it's honestly easier if you work in both digital and in black and white. It's easier to go ahead and leave your inks kind of open and unfilled in and then fill in your spot blacks digitally because that way you can always, you know, reutilize it for other things. Whereas if you fill it with black, you're going to, there are ways you can fix that so it doesn't look like you slap color on a coloring book page but that takes a lot of effort and it might not be worth it So, um, for example, let me zoom in. This area here where I didn't connect the line art, that is um, an example of, some people call it like hide and seek lines or drop lines. And I'm doing that because there's gonna be a highlight there. And yeah, I could get rid of that highlight digitally, but by doing it in the line art, it really helps enforce that there's light hitting there or you know a lighter area hitting there because when you add a black liner you are adding sort of like a weight or shadow to um your your line art to your entire piece so you do want to be selective about the areas that you add heavy line art to another area you want to consider is with the hair um so the undersides of hair or areas that are turned away from the light would get a heavier line weight whereas you might even leave the line unfinished over here where the light is hitting it and some illustrators some artists really um, make the most of that and that is a huge part of their style some don't use that at all I mean there are some fantastic illustrators and comic artists who have like kind of a flat line weight style in their black and white comics and it works for them and then there are others who are really reliant on these bouncy dynamic vibrant lines And honestly, inker me and colorist me don't always get along very well. Um, colorist me is often correcting the sins that inker me left. Or she's decided to change where the light source is going to be or. Um, you know, basically, uh, me in the future is not the same person as me right now. <laughs> so the decisions. I might make a week from now are going to be pretty different from the decisions, the artistic decisions I'm going to make today. So I do like to leave myself room to make those changes if necessary.
And the signal also takes time to dry, which is why I'm kind of inking in a weird way. I'm trying to work around where I know the signal is still wet because I don't want to drag my hand through it. So one last thing about those hide and seek lines is you can also have a line in between the two um, sort of broken areas. Or you can have multiple lines. I mean, you can do, it can look like stitching, honestly, if you wanted to, if that works for you. I sort of goofed on the line weight up there, so I need to fix it. Or rather, I'm going to fix it. All right, my hand is sufficiently warmed up. So I am switching over now back to Adam. This is gonna be a lot easier because I don't have that, the stupid spiral binding to worry about. And pretty much regardless of what I am inking, I start with the objects that are on top of other objects first. So I'm starting with the hair. Seems like my head is always in the shot, so I'm gonna try and fix that. Man, it is so much easier to ink on cardstock after you've been inking on sketchbook paper because it's so much smoother. And even though he has wand eyebrows i like to do just a few of those like little pin flicks rather than leaving the eyebrows like completely blank and since blake is currently a traditional artist i mean a digital artist i'm gonna leave the line work kind of open so if he wants to color it he will be able to do that So going way back to, um, let me explain my thought process, I guess. I was thinking about the fact that I'm glad I'm doing, I did a warm up first because these inks are turning out, I, they are turning out well. I like them. They have like good bounce dynamic line art. I'm really glad I like warmed up on something else first. And then I was thinking about how um, it was taking me a little while to warm up. 
tonight because those bird drawings weren't really turning out the way I really wanted them to. Um, which is fine. I mean, they're warm ups, but usually, usually by the second one, they're starting to look pretty good. And just like none of, none of them were working for me. Um, but that's also because I have made myself so busy preparing for cons, finishing commissions. Um, doing stuff for the YouTube channel, doing stuff for the blog, that I don't prioritize doing warm ups anymore. Um, I mean, it's just the casualty of of being too busy. Um, but I really miss doing the warm ups, and they were really an important part of my drawing process. And if you're the sort of artist who it takes you a really long time to feel motivated warm-ups are a great way to sort of short circuit that because you can do a warm-up and it can look terrible and that doesn't matter it i mean it doesn't matter because who's going to see it who's it for it's not for anybody it's for you um and you can sort of trick your brain into getting into the drawing zone by doing warm-ups or at least that's something that works for me Of course, I have been so busy trying to get everything done that, you know, it's easy to cheat myself out of doing the warm ups because, like, the motivation is already there. The motivation is fear that I won't get everything done in time before I leave. Okay, so we're finally at a couple of things I wanted to talk to you guys about when I was doing the blue lines and um, I knew that they wouldn't be visible. So one of the cheaty things I have for folds is that little O thing over here. And that comes into play when someone has their arm up or, or their legs bent. Um, in like jeans or pants um, because it reads as like a little pocket fold and normally I wouldn't do it so round. Um, let me get to the next one. So here are those little shoelace things I was telling you about that many hoodies have. Maybe I just like drawing shoelaces. And then here is, let me draw the neck first. And there are, so when you draw those triangles for a hoodie, you want to draw them, if you can, you want to draw a few like bumps in them. And that sort of sells the fact that it's like fabric that's piled up on itself. And then you can color in the area between the shoulder blade and the hoodie, and that helps sell that, like, the hood itself, the pocket. And for interior lines like seams, I like to do a lighter line than I would for like a fold or a crease or an exterior line. Um, it really just helps sort of keep, there, there's like a hierarchy of importance when it comes to things. Um, and I don't want to complicate this for you guys because a lot of this is not stuff I've like externalized. I haven't talked about it yet, so I haven't thought about it all the way through. But like things like seams, they're important and they dictate how clothing look on the body. They they help the, the viewer understand what things are supposed to be. But they're not as important as, say, 
um, the chin overlapping the neck or the arm overlapping, the forearm overlapping the back part of the arm. So while it needs to be drawn, it's drawn with a lighter line weight. Just like the, the lines on the cuff, they're not as important, but they do help define the, the form and they also help define the item. And it's thicken those lines up. And as things fall into shadow, their line weights are going to get heavier. So with pants, um, a lot of people have trouble drawing the crotch of pants and um, what a lot of people end up doing is they, they draw this, right? Like, and, and that's the crotch, but, oh, was I off camera? I'll do it again. So they draw like a V and then they draw two lines and like say that's the shirt and that's the crotch, right? But with jeans, even though your crotch might be cut in a V, the way it usually looks is those are the two legs. That's the fly of your jeans. That's some creases in the jeans. Those are the jeans. Out of, out of out of blue lead really I uh, chewed it all up So I didn't draw the pockets in earlier. But they're pretty easy to add in. Most jeans have like little U-shaped front pockets. And now we're going to, uh, we're finally on the jeans. And uh, there's, so around the knees, you're going to get creases. Even if you're standing up, there's usually some creases still there from when you were sitting down. And those can be really simple to render, just like a little squiggle like that. And then where the pants hit the shoe, they're going to have some creases too. Even skinny jeans have these sort of creases because denim is a heavy fabric, so it has to have somewhere to go. And you might, for the way you draw, you might opt not to um, have those creases in because it might break the line of your drawing. And I, I understand that. I respect that. That works, that works. But for me, I like drawing those creases in. Um, and also jeans have inseams and outseams, which 
our handy details to include. So we're going to do that with a lighter line art because it's not as important as the line art that defines the shape of the jeans themselves. One of the reasons I like to do overlapping shapes first is because it means I have to fix less. All right, so Adam is finished. And um, this is pretty much open line work. I did fill in some areas of spot black just to sort of help define the form underneath to help um, illustrate, <laughs> help convey, there we go, help convey what's going on to make it easier if someone were to decide to color it afterwards. So I'm going to switch over to my last thing in these last 15 minutes. Blake, thank you so much for loaning Adam to me. It was really fun to get to draw a guy because it would have been like the all female stream yet again. And here is a cute little lady that I'm going to be using for um, hopefully some prints coming up. But I'm going to respond to some blah, blah, blah. I'm going to respond to some stuff going on in the chat, and I'll be right back. Man, it's going to be like going back to the dark ages because I had the nice cardstock paper and it was a little bit smoother than my sketch sketchbook paper and I didn't have this thing getting in the way and now it's like back to the sketchbook. But I didn't want... Since my hand is getting kind of tired, I didn't want to put off doing art of somebody else's character until I was exhausted because then I'm not doing as good a job as I could be doing.
one of the nice things about having original characters is you can ink them however you want. So, thick, bouncy liner. Yes, please. And since we're kind of on the topic of OCs, and I just uh, drew Blake's character, Adam, if you're one of my backers and you want me to do your character during one of the streams, just let me know. I'd be happy to do it, especially in chibi style. Like, that's what this is for. <laughs> it's kind of what I figured this was going to be, you know? Like, I wanted to <laughs> draw other people's <laughs> characters. And as demand rises, I will put a tip jar out. But while things are still kind of slow, just come in and ask. Send me a link. Or, I mean, if you want me to draw your portrait or your kid or, you know, whatever. Like, that, this is meant as a thank you to you guys. So it's no problem at all. And the reason, in case you're wondering, the reason I twist my line art around a whole lot is because I'm always trying to find the best angle for me for inking. Because so. there's certain angles I know my wrist is really good at pulling, like towards me, but not away from me. Um, it just, the ink ends up getting all streaky. So I usually want to pull longer lines towards me. And um, it's really about practice. It's about finding the tools you like. Because if you're using, if you're using like um, a crow quill, for example, those definitely work best when pulled towards you and want to fight you when pulled away from you. So it's all about finding tools that work and then how to get the best out of them.
So when I do digital art, I prefer to work with a traditional line art, like this one that I'm preparing here. Um, and the reason for that is that with digital art, I will spend, if I'm inking, I will spend forever tweaking the line art to try and get the sort of um, lines that I can just naturally get with a food aid pen. That's because I am way more experienced with using this sort of pen than I really am with digital inking. I just really don't put a lot of time into digital inking. So um, for me, the combination of traditional inks with, or more traditional inks really, with uh, digital line art, I'm, dang it, digital color just works a lot better. Um, but you need to find the sort of, of combination that really works for you. Um, and don't feel bad if what works for me doesn't work for you. Because, I mean, we were all artists go through that where we see something really cool and we're like, oh, I want to learn how to do that. And we try and the practice isn't wasted, but we do realize that it's just not a style that works for us. And some artists get really bummed out because they're like, I guess they, they feel like like that's the only way to do that particular thing is in that style that that other artist did. And I'm trying to tell you guys that it doesn't matter. Like whatever works for you and accomplishes the goals you want to accomplish. That's great. Like that's that's enough. I think that's about it with my weird unicorn girl person. And I think that's also about it for the stream tonight because it is 9.06. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming and hanging out with me for a few hours. Um, if you want to get in on the action, I know those of you who are watching this right now are already backers, but this is going to go up on YouTube, at least the, just the video. But it is going to go up on YouTube. If you want to get in on the action, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash netosuit. I do these once a month, and my backers are sent a password so that they can participate. I want you guys to come in and ask me questions, talk about comics, talk about art, um, bring your original characters, bring characters from your comics so I can draw them for you because that's my way of saying, one of my ways of saying thank you for being so supportive and believing in me. I had a good time. I'm still sort of learning how to juggle the talking and the reading, the chat and handling all that. Um, but hopefully as the months go by, I will get smoother at it. Um, backers, if you have any suggestions or comments, please let me know through Patreon and I will get on those because you guys are my priority. I'm Becca Hilburn. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you later. Bye.